Well, I want to welcome you again back to our series on how to build godly confidence in your life. Because like Tom said, it's some rough times. Life's tough. Life has been tough, and I suspect it will remain tough for all of us. And on top of external things like the pandemic, all of us carry scars in our lives uh, where people have hurt us. And today I want to look at how do we heal the scars that we carry because these scars shatter our confidence. Now there's a lot of different things that will do that, but I think the number one cause is rejection. We've all been rejected, maybe by our parents, maybe by our friends. It could be by our spouse. Or it might even be people we, we don't even know who they are. It's part of life, I guess. Sometimes we think, well, if I could just be perfect, then everybody would love me. Well, but that's not true, is it? Look at those scriptures on the board. Jesus was despised and rejected. His own people did not accept him. There's a lot of different kinds of a rejection out there. But I think the one all of us are most familiar with is plain old verbal rejection. For example, how many times have you heard this? What in the world is wrong with you anyway? My favorite. Why can't you be more like my first wife? And then some of them are just cruel. You've been nothing but trouble since you were born. You make me sick. Can't you do anything right? No wonder you don't have any friends. I can't believe you did such a thing. You'll never amount to anybody. Now on the playground, we used to sing, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But that really wasn't true, was it? Names do hurt. And it really doesn't take quite as long to heal a broken bone as it does to heal a broken spirit. Here's a verse from the Bible you might not have known was there. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword. We all face it. And when we're rejected and rejected, after a while we start to reject ourselves. And then we start to reject other people, all the people around us. And at that point, we reject even God. And you'd be surprised, maybe not, how many people have gone down that road and never come back home. David says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. How's he do it? Very simple, actually, by changing the way you think. See, here's how it works. The way you think affects the way you feel. And the way you feel affects the way you act or live. So if you are acting depressed, well, obviously that's because you feel depressed. And if you feel depressed, it is because deep down you are thinking depressed kind of things. So God's, God heals the scars from our past by simply saying, you got to break that cycle. you got to stop it. And he says, listen, it's time for you to hear the truth. Your parents weren't perfect. You're not a perfect parent either. <laughs> You're not a perfect friend. You're not a perfect spouse. You're not a perfect employee or a employer. But all through life, all of us have given kind of a distorted image of who we think we are and how we think we've got it together. We have given that image to the people around us. And it's usually <laughs> in error. But, but even worse... In the same time, all of us have grown up hearing things that have been said about us that are just not true. But we bought into them. We carry them around. 
God says if you want to get free from some of these scars that will actually rob you of any confidence, you have to fill your life with truth. When you were a kid, you believed in all sort of fairies and bunnies and storks who brought babies. But as you grew up, you had to dismiss these and learn and discover what truth is. You were forced to change your beliefs. It's time for some of us to grow up emotionally today. You, we, me, we carry scars from what people have said about us from our earliest days. Today I want to give you five things that God says about you. Because you have a choice. You can believe what God thinks about you, or you can believe what your neighbor thinks about you. Which one's going to give you more self-confidence? I think you already know that answer. Five quick things won't take long at all, but number one, God says, I'm acceptable. Have you noticed how hard it is for us? We want to be accepted in everything we do and what we, where we go. I mean, we buy things to be accepted. We wear things to be accepted. We join things. All for the benefit of just being accepted by the crowd. <coughs> As a little kid, did you ever take a dare just so you would be accepted by the group? I, I did. I expect you did too. Come near to killing ourselves just because we want to be accepted by everybody else. God says in Ephesians, God has accepted us in the beloved one. That's Jesus. And in Romans it says, accept one another just as Christ has already accepted you. Most of you are already believers today. But you know in church we constantly tell people they need to accept Jesus as Lord. Accept Jesus as Lord. And that's absolutely true. I'm not you know, saying anything against that at all. That's why we're here. That's our mission. But have you ever realized that God has accepted you in the process? God has, God has gone out of his way to unconditionally accept you where you are. Now, someone says God loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay like that too long. And I think there's some truth in that. But God accepts us. David says, even if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Some of you, let's, again, let's be honest. Some of you grew up with unpleasable parents. They were perfectionists. And no matter how much you did, it was never enough. You never measured up. You never got their approval. And some of you, you grew up with parents who, frankly, didn't know how to love you as you really should have been loved. And even today, you're still trying to get their approval. Let me say two things. Number one, in all likelihood, you'll never get it if you don't have it now. And I say that not because of who you are, but simply because who your parents were and the way they were raised in the generation that they may have lived in. They may have already passed and gone on, but you're still waiting for their approval. It's not going to happen. And number two, you don't need it. You don't need everyone's approval to be happy. And it's a tremendous relief. It's like something, you know, a couple cinder blocks just come right off of your chest when you finally realize you don't have to be approved by everybody else. There's 7.8 billion people in the world. There's plenty of people out there to prove you and to accept you. Find somebody who does. And by the way, what do you think God made the church for? God made this church to be a place where you are accepted as family. And I'm serious here. If you are serious about following Jesus, you will be accepted here. 
It might be hard. You may have the same problem accepting us, but we're into the accepting business. Number two, God says, I'm acceptable. I am also valuable. God feeds the birds. I'm a lot more valuable to him than a bird. God says, you're precious to me. You're honored and I love you. How much are you worth? Just this week, I read a really gross article on the internet. It caught my attention and I couldn't turn away from it. I had to read it all. It was a simple thing. I asked the internet, how much am I worth? And the article came back and said, on a good day in the black market, you can sell all of my body parts for about $45 million. But it went on to say that that's incredibly rare. And that as a matter of fact, the average street price of your body is one half million dollars. And I'm thinking, did you know you can sell your heart for $250,000? I mean, I don't think I would even finish counting the money before I would be in bad shape without heart. <laughs> you can sell your liver. You can sell a kidney or kidneys. And it went on down to list. And I'm not even talking black market now. I'm talking regular business. You can sell it. It's yours <laughs> if you really want it to sell it that bad. It was an incredibly gross article and obviously had nothing to do with this message except to say that <laughs> I'm obviously not talking about money even if you're worth a half a million or a million dollars. Yeah, I mean back in the old days they said we will figure up all your elements and all your chemicals and you came up to like three bucks. You know, at least, at least it's gone up now. Inflation says we're worth more. But I'm talking about not money. I'm talking about you, your life. What are you worth? Jesus tells a story, big long story. In fact, it takes an entire chapter in your New Testament to record it. I'll give you the short of it. He says he talks about a, a son that was lost and then found, and a, a, some coins that were lost and then found, and, and a sheep who was lost and then found. And every one of these little stories ends the same way. You're valuable to God. Three times now, this is the third message. I'm going to say it again. You matter to God. Jesus died for you. The very fact that he was willing to die for you speaks what you're worth. You're acceptable. You're valuable. And number three, you're lovable. Some of you. <laughs> no, I love your love. Well, Isaiah says, The mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end, so says the Lord who loves you. That's important because you will never be a lovable kind of a person until you feel loved. That's just human nature. If you don't feel the love, you're not going to share the love. And God loves you. He's not fickle. He doesn't love you one day and then the next day decide he doesn't love you. Uh, he doesn't love you on your good days, but not on your bad days. He loves you. No strings attached. <coughs> a lot of you grew up with conditional love. To a degree, even I did. I had a, a wonderful mom. But the people around us said, if you do this, then I'll love you. And it was always like, can you do just a little bit more? Because I love you so much. But the story, the message was always clear. Your love for me depends on what I do for you. That's conditional. That's not unconditional. Want some good news from Daniel? God loves you. So don't anything worry you or frighten you. Number four. God says, I am forgivable. And aren't you glad of that? Because we all need that. We all need forgiveness. A guy is driving up to his cabin in the mountains. He's driving his new car and it dies by the side of the road. He gets out and just as soon as he gets out, another car comes to the other direction, doesn't see his car, plows it in, knocks it 
just, just totally destroys it. The guy goes over to his car, what's left of it. He gets out all his gear and decides he's going to hike on up the mountain the four miles to his cabin. It starts raining. It starts snowing. And by the time he gets there, he's soaked to the bones. And he comes around the corner and he looks and his cabin has burned down to the ground. And that's about all he can handle. It's all he can take. He goes over, starts banging his head against a tree, and he says, why me, God? Why me? And then all of a sudden, the clouds part. And a deep, booming voice from heaven says, because some people just tick me off. I tell you that story, and I know you've heard it before. The fact is, a lot of you still think that's true. Every time something starts to go wrong in your life, you figure you just tick God off, and He's paying you back. He's getting even with you. Does God really treat His children that way? A lot of that depends on how your parents treated you. Because a lot of times we just transfer that image we have of our parents to God. But does God really do that? Isaiah says, I'm the God who forgives your sin, and I do this because of who I am, and I will not hold your sin against me, against you. You realize that? Once we've confessed it, it's gone. It's forgiven. God does bring it up again. Well, why do we, why do we keep bringing up our past? I have a pastor friend who talks all sorts of stories. But one of his stories says he knows a lady, had a lady in his church came to his office every week and said, Pastor, God has convicted me of this sin. And she would go on to tell him. And in the following week, she would come and say, Pastor, God has convicted me of this sin. It was different. And it was almost like she had the sin of the week club, you know. Because the next week she would come and say, Pastor, God has convicted me of this sin. And then finally one day, the pastor said, Does God ever say anything nice to you? <laughs> Let me ask you. Does God ever say anything nice to you? Because I'm going to tell you, it's very easy to have grown up with an understanding and a concept of God that He is out to get you. I always tell, tell you about George Jones and Tammy Wynette. God's going to get you for that, uh-huh. Beautiful song in the 30s. But somewhere along the line, God wants you to learn the truth. God is a loving Father. And if you're a Christian, God's not mad at you. He's forgiven you. Look particularly at Ephesians on the, the screen. Through what Christ did for us, he decided to make us holy in His eyes without a single fault as we stand before God covered with His love. That is just awesome. If you're a Christian, when God looks at you, He looks at you through the filter or the lens or the window, however you want to see it, of Jesus. And instead of seeing you exactly the way you are, He sees you as Jesus has made you. Blameless. Holy, without fault or blemish. Now when God made you, He knew in advance all the bad things you were going to do. And He still loves you. And when God made you, He knew in advance all the skeletons that would be in your closet. And He's not shocked about them even today. He knows today what you're going to do wrong in the next 10 years, God give you that long to live. And He still loves you. The good news, God says, I'm forgiven. And that's got to change the confidence. Last one, God says, I'm capable. <coughs> From the Amplified Translation, Paul writes, I have strength for all things in Christ Jesus who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and I'm equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. When you get God's Spirit in your life, that ought to bring some confidence. 
Real confidence. I'm not talking about the stuff you find in the, the local Bible bookstore or any bookstore. God kind of confidence. A lot of you, most of you, are doing well by the world standards. You're getting by. You're hanging in there. But there is still that inner security in your life. And the question is, why? And the answer is that you keep listening over and over again to these tapes from your past. You replay them in your mind all the time. Some of you may still be acting on things that people told you 30 years ago. They weren't true then, but you're still acting on it. You remember when they said you don't matter, and the truth is you do matter. You remember when they said you're a loser, and the truth is you're not a loser. And you'll never amount to anything. The truth is you have. You have already succeeded. you got to stop believing the lies. You have to start listening to what God says about you. God accepts you. God loves you. God says you're valuable. God says you're worth forgiving. And you also have the capability to do anything through Christ that God gives you strength. Now, like I said in the beginning, you've got two choices. You can either build your confidence on what God says about you or what your grandma or grandpa or the next door neighbor or somebody said way, way back. Psychology comes out and says your self-image, your self-concept, comes from what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. And I, I agree with that. I think it's absolutely true. The only problem about that, as you painfully know, sometimes the most important person in your life can reject you and let you down. That's why Jesus needs to be the most important person in your life. That's why what he thinks about you matters so much in what you think about yourself. That's why you really do need to make him Lord and Savior. Come on up, guys. Let's share a final song. You stand with us and use that song to bring you closer to your Savior as well.